Kenyon. I'm from Greener Pastures Ranching. Um, so apart from the intrinsic value of, of biodiversity and wild populations of, of flora and fauna in our province. I just am going to tell you from our farm perspective what we would do or what our plans would be going forward so that we can handle whatever the future may bring. In the winter of 2018, we asked three agricultural producers from three different parts of Alberta to tell us how they would adapt to a changing climate. If it gets warmer, what kind of crops will you plant? If it gets drier, how are you going to graze your cattle? That kind of stuff. Today, we're going to listen to what they had to say. I'm Derek Leahy, and this is Rural Routes to Climate Solutions. Just in case you're wondering, what you're about to hear is one of those presentations we recorded from the Organic Alberta Conference in 2018. It was actually the keynote on day two of the conference, and personally, I think it's one of the best keynotes I've ever listened to. And if anybody's curious, a keynote is simply the presentation that's meant to get everybody all fired up at the conference. Uh, It's kind of like the main event. The three producers who spoke didn't base their presentations on how they thought the climate would change in Alberta. Although they did add some personal observations, which are just as valuable as scientific findings. But before they actually put their presentations together, the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, which tracks changes in wildlife and habitats in Alberta, they provided the producers with projections, so their best guesses, on how the climate is likely to change in Alberta. Now, these projections are based on data the Institute had collected, as well as other scientific bodies. We're actually going to hear the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute present on those findings in a second. But just before we go any further, I think it's important we make a distinction between changes in weather and changes in climate. Because I feel the two do get confused quite a lot, which is fair enough because they are connected. Weather is the day-to-day state of the atmosphere. It's raining, it's snowing, it's hot. Whether this is noticeable changes in the atmosphere that happen in a short period of time, these changes will happen in minutes, days, weeks. Climate, on the other hand, this is like taking the long view on weather. Climate is weather averaged out over a longer period of time, like decades. Having more frost-free days than we did 50 years ago indicates a change in climate. Climatic changes are also based on ecological regions. So for us in Alberta, I wouldn't really be talking about climatic changes in Edmonton or Calgary, for example. It would be more ecological regions like the Aspen Parkland or Fescue's grasslands. I'm hoping this makes some sense here. The reason I think it's important to understand the difference between weather and climate is because it'll help you understand the adaptation strategies of these producers a bit more. If the weather changes from sunny to rainy, I simply adapt by putting on my muck boots and a raincoat. If the climate changes so things get warmer or wetter in Alberta than it was 30 years ago, for example, well, hell, then I start looking into planting mango trees or something like that, which I realize is kind of a far-fetched example, but you see what I'm saying here. These producers were taking the long view with their adaptation strategies. Let's listen to what Monica Kohler of the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute had to say. My presentation is going to be really geared towards talking about biodiversity, so the species and ecosystems that we have here in Alberta. And I'm hoping to talk to you about that biodiversity and a project that we were involved in that looked at what climate change means for those species and those ecosystems that are living in the province. So we've already seen the climate change in Alberta. The average temperature has increased by about 1.4 degrees Celsius since the beginning of the uh, century. If we look at provincial averages, so averaged across the year and the entire province from about the 60s to the 90s, the average temperature was 0.6 degrees Celsius in Alberta. And you can see that that's variable across latitude and elevation. So as you move further north and up into the mountains, the average temperatures are cooler. When we project that out into the mid-century, so the 2040s to 2070s, the average temperature is expected to increase to 3.1 degrees Celsius. And I've got a couple of points labeled on that map there. I've got Elk Island National Park, which is just outside of Edmonton. And then I have Writing on Stone, which is down on the U.S. border. So currently, the average temperature at Elk Island is 3 degrees Celsius, and at Writing on Stone, it's 5. By the mid-century, the predictions are that Elk Island will have a temperature more similar to what we have at Writing on Stone today. 
If you take that out a step further to the end of the century, the average temperature is expected to be 4.7 degrees Celsius, and Elk Island National Park will actually be warmer than what we have at Writing on Stone today. So those are pretty massive changes in terms of temperature here in Alberta. And temperature is not the only thing that's expected to change. They're expecting that there'll be increases in precipitation, so we'll see more precipitation, but overall less soil moisture. So because things are going to be warmer, there'll be more evaporation, which will leave less moisture behind in the soil for plant growth. There's also predicted to be more extreme weather events. So all of those things come together to mean a longer growing season, higher temperatures, lower soil moisture, more storms, and overall a loss of wetland habitat, particularly in the southern part of the province. And all of these changes in climate have implications for the sorts of habitats and ecosystems that we have here in Alberta. So the ecosystems that we have are divided up into different natural regions and natural subregions. We have the grasslands in the southern part of the province, and then the aspen parkland kind of in the middle, and the boreal forest occupying the northern half of the province. So we can take those climate predictions and predict out what we expect to see in terms of changes to these ecosystems. So if we look at the mid part of the century, the expectation is that our grassland and parkland ecosystems are going to expand further north into the province, and we'll see a reduction in the amount of boreal forest. Taking that out further to the 2080s, we predict that around that time, the grassland ecosystem will become the dam do dominant uh, habitat type across Alberta, um, dominating most of the province, and the boreal forest is going to be restricted to just a few small pockets of high elevation places in northern Alberta. Um, so these maps are very much predictions. They're not a certainty. They uh, change depending on what climate model you use, what carbon scenarios. There's a lot of uncertainty built into these maps. Um, but one thing that is very consistent across the scenarios is that boreal grassland transition. So um, that sort of change is definitely something that we expect to happen. And to tie that to sort of a tangible example, we can go back to Elk Island National Park. So Elk Island is currently in the dry mixed wood boreal zone. So it's a mixed wood forest with coniferous and deciduous trees. So it has a lot of woody, leafy vegetation. Given what we expect for grassland transition, we can basically see that ecosystem at Elk Island to transition over time to a dry mixed grass prairie. So obviously that's a very different type of habitat with very different vegetation. These sorts of changes are not going to be instant. These happen over very long time periods. And there's a role for disturbance in facilitating these changes. So it's not like the trees are just going to fall over overnight and, and give up. Um, there's going to have to be disturbance events like fire or insects or um, harvest events that actually remove that vegetation. And then it's about the new plant community that's going to regrow. That will be determined by the new climate conditions that are there at the time. So that just sort of reinforces that there is a lot of uncertainty around the timing of when these changes are going to happen and exactly how and where and when. Uh, but we do know that these sorts of changes can be expected and over long enough time periods, they're going to be um, quite dramatic. So from the perspective of a native species that lives here in Alberta faced with these changes, they really sort of have two options in terms of how they can respond. They can either stay where they are and adapt to these new conditions, or they can move and follow the habitat and the climate that they're used to. Uh, and both of those options can present some challenges. Uh, just as a couple of examples, um, many early spring blooming plants like prairie crocus are starting to bloom earlier and earlier in the year. Uh, but there's this mismatch between some of those plants and their pollinators, where the pollinators aren't emerging as early as the plants are blooming. So there's this breakdown in the pollination services for those plants, and there's also different plants blooming that the pollinators aren't used to traditionally. So that's a, the type of sort of relationship that's going to have to struggle and co-adapt together uh, to these new conditions. Another example from Alberta is white-tailed deer. Obviously, they're a lot more mobile than plants, so it's a lot easier for them to move and follow the habitat and the climate that they're used to. Uh, and there's examples in Alberta of white-tailed deer 
expanding their range further north and being able to increase their abundance because there's, the winters have been less severe. And that expansion and increase further north is now being linked as one of the factors that's contributing to declines in woodland caribou in northern Alberta, which is obviously a huge uh, management issue for people up there. So that's an example of some sort of unintended or unanticipated consequences as species try to adjust to these new conditions. One of the ways that you can assess some of that variability in how different species respond to climate change is to look at vulnerability. So we were involved in a project where we assessed the vulnerability of 170 different species here in Alberta. And we did that by looking at the exposure, so how much of their habitat is expected to change as a result of climate change, and also sensitivity, so how sensitive are they to those changes. And we use those two metrics to come up with Uh, an index of vulnerability. And what came out of that, looking at those 170 different species, is that amphibians were identified as the most sensitive group of species here in Alberta to climate change. And that's largely because they rely on wetland habitat for their breeding. And particularly in southern Alberta, there's predicted to be a loss of wetland habitat. So there's going to be this change, exposure um, to their habitat where there's less habitat available. And then they're also uh, not that great at moving around. So they're not very mobile, which makes them more sensitive. And in particular, they really have a hard time moving when they run into humans. So if they hit a road or a city or a cropped field, that's a pretty big barrier for them in terms of trying to move to find a new wetland to live in. So that makes them really vulnerable to some of these uh, climate changes that we can expect. Uh, Another group that came out as being particularly vulnerable is species at risk. So these are species that are already listed as threatened or endangered. They already exist in low numbers in the province and are experiencing existing pressures on uh, their numbers. So that added layer of having to adapt to a new climate is something that they also struggle with. The uh, flip side to vulnerability is that there are some species that are actually predicted to do well and actually be able to thrive and benefit because of climate change. So in a separate project, we looked at invasive plants and how we can expect them to respond to this changing climate. Um, And we were able to identify three different species that are listed up there that are um, on the Weed Control Act currently that are expected to become more aggressive and be more successful in their invasions as the climate warms and creates new available climate envelopes for them. And we also were able to identify species, uh, the example there is the Syrian bean caper, that um, are not currently on the Weed Control Act, but they're predicted to become more of a problem as there's more suitable habitat created for them in Alberta. So this is an example of the type of information that you can use to anticipate some of the challenges that might be coming down the line because of climate change and also potentially take some proactive action in response. In terms of other ways to adapt to climate change, from a biodiversity perspective, it's really about maintaining areas of natural habitat. So maintaining our protected areas network, our parks network, conserving wetlands, and in particular maintaining the connectivity of those different natural habitats so that it's easier for species to move when they need to. Um, And then also, again, from a biodiversity perspective, having access to ongoing, up-to-date monitoring information is really critical to understand what's happening. As part of this project, we had to pull together data and information from a bunch of different monitoring systems and research projects. Um, So maintaining that ongoing monitoring system and being able to pull together up-to-date information helps us understand not only the changes that are happening right now, but also being able to build better and more accurate predictions of what's going to happen in the future. So the stage was set. Monica presented the changes that could potentially be coming our way because of climate change. And then it was up to our producers to explain how they would adapt. And if you want to find out a little bit more about the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, I recommend listening to episode three of our podcast where Corina Kopp discusses all the cool online tools producers can use to track biodiversity on their land. The first producer to present was Amber Kenyon. If you've ever been to a workshop or a farm tour tour, and Amber was there, you definitely know who Amber Kenyon is. Before I explain that statement there, Amber, if you're listening to this right now, 
Please don't take any of this the wrong way. I, I really do mean this in the best way possible. Amber is usually the person in the workshop who is just bursting with enthusiasm for the subject matter. She can barely contain it and she usually winds up sharing her thoughts with the rest of the group and we all learn something in the process. She is a rancher in Westlock, which is about an hour and 20 minutes north of Edmonton. She is also an outreach officer with the Farm Energy and Agro Processing Program. Thank you. So I'm Amber Kenyon. I'm from Greener Pastures Ranching. Um, we are a diverse farm up north by West Lock. And we do a number of things on our farm. One of the, our main operations is custom grazing cattle. So with the cattle we um, rotationally graze. We run approximately 800 to 1200 head of cattle on about 3000 acres of land, give or take. So all of our land is leased. And that makes us a little bit unique because we actually don't own cows and we don't own land, but we still manage to ranch. Um, okay. Uh, so this is one of our herds. Um, through good rotational grazing, we are able to manage our soil. Um, we may we kind of consider ourselves more of soil farmers than we do uh, cattle farmers. So the other thing that we do is we rotationally graze our pastured pigs as well. Um, with these, we're moving them every couple of days and we're using the exact same grazing concepts that we use with cattle. So we're in the habit of proving that it doesn't matter what kind of livestock you use, you need to be moving them. You can't leave them on one piece of land and expect the soil to be taking care of itself. I really like this saying, um, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone and create enough waves in the water to do a ripple, I said that wrong. Uh, it's by Mother Teresa, um, and I really think, especially in agriculture, this is true. As climate change is coming, it is changing things, it has been changing things, we're really seeing this. Like In agriculture, we actually have the power to make a difference, and that's unique of almost any other industry. I mean, one person can make more of a difference in agriculture than anywhere else. So. We are already seeing the effects of drought in the rest of the world. Um, this is from California in 2015. These, it, it's happening. Like, this is in Texas, 2011. This is in South Africa, just last year. And of course, Alberta, our drought in 2015 as well was very severe. And I'm sure almost everybody in this room was affected by it. Um, this is the drought map from Alberta in 2015, and this was really bad. Like, all of the red there is places that were in severe or moderate drought. This is, you know, this is coming, and whether or not you believe in climate change, water is our most limiting resource already. Um, every one of us has experienced drought and the effects of it, and I think this is one of the things that we can make a difference with it. Um, this is our local weather station here in Busby. So in the last four years, we have actually had drought conditions. Um, 2015, of course, being the worst. 2017, we were finally back up to a normal precipitation amount. So what I want to get down to is drought resilience in your land. This is what's going to make a big difference for us as farmers, is making sure that our land is drought resilient, and it is drought resilient, and it is one of the things that we actually have a power to make a difference with. So through rotational grazing, we are managing our soil. We are making sure that our soil holds on to every little bit of moisture that comes down, that our plants are able to use it, the soil organisms are able to use it. And when we have that cycle in effect, we are taking care of the entire system rather than just trying to manage for one or two things, which is what's caused us to be in, in a state of problem as it is. Um, so this is what the water cycle is supposed to look like. We're not supposed to be losing our moisture to, to run off. We're not supposed to be losing it to um, evaporation. And that's what's happening in a lot of agricultural land. Whereas if we can get our soil in good shape, we are actually going to be bringing that water right into it and infiltrating into the soil. So I'm going to get down to August 2015, or that, that whole year. The drone in our area was very severe. Our land is in fantastic shape. I'm very proud to say that we've been taking care of it for a long time, and we are quite drought resistant. Our grass was in great shape. We had more than enough grass to feed our cattle, and 800, our one herd was 800 head this year, and we were able to feed them just fine. Had tons of grass ahead of us. Our dugouts, however, 
we were really low on water. When you haven't had rain for months, there's only so much you can do for this. So come August, we were getting pretty darn nervous. We're like, hey, how are we going to do this? We need to have some kind of backup plan. We need to figure something out because if we don't get rain soon, we're going to be in big trouble here. Um, 800 head of steers don't want to wait for their water. They're, they get pushy. So we, you know, trying to come up with solutions. Sure enough, rain came. This is the Sobeys parking lot in Westlock. We ended up getting five inches of rain within like, I think it was 24 hours or something. It was crazy. So people were boating in the parking lot. They had a great time. Um, Steve and I afterwards were like, hey, we need to talk about this. Like, this is going to be fun. We're going to go to our dugout and we're going to see all this water. You know, our land's in great shape. Let, let's go see what, what happens. So we go to our dugout. That's what we saw. Really? Okay, we've been working on this. How do we not have more water than our neighbors? I don't understand it. Um, we might have gotten that five inches, but that's not enough, again, to feed 800 head of cattle in water. So a couple of weeks pass by, and we're trying to figure out, okay, what did we do wrong? What can we do different? Um, after a couple of weeks, we go back out to our dugouts, and they're full. This was amazing to see. We were so excited because this really showed our water cycle is in good condition. Um, it took two weeks to get this water, but that meant every single one of those plants had a chance to get a drink. Our soil organisms had a chance to get what they needed out of it. Um, and then eventually it filled up and we got a lot more than the five inches that some of our neighbors might have gotten. So what I really want to reinforce is that Drought resiliency is going to be huge. As things change and as we have less, less moisture in our soils, if you can hold on to every drop of water you get, we're going to be able to stay profitable. We're going to be able to stay ranching and stay farming. And it's, it's going to be of the utmost importance. And that's not even coming into the carbon carrying capacity of your soils if, you're, if they're in good shape. Like, it's, it's so important. So yeah, that's all I have for you. I really like that line. We are soil farmers, not cattle farmers. So that's a pretty good one there. I'm also now wondering, is it possible to mob graze pigs? I just really like the thought of it. I'm moving on to Chris Vester. Every time I see Chris Vester, I think of Treebeard from Lord of the Rings. He's this big, gentle giant with this big, bushy beard. He's also a pretty busy guy. He runs a mix farm with veg, grains, hogs, laying hands, and I think he's still the president of Slow Food Calgary. He also runs one of the only farms I've come across in Canada that's a biodynamic farm, which obviously for somebody like me who's half Austrian, that makes me kind of happy. The thing I really liked about Chris's presentation is he went over both the negative and positive impacts the changing climate would have on um, his farm. There are going to be serious impacts for growers, producers in this province as well. And I was invited to uh, contribute um, some perspective from a vegetable producer's perspective. And this is not blanket for the province because we are at 3,700 feet of altitude in the foothills. And so I can't speak to the people who are in the lower altitudes in the southern part or say up in the peace country or way, way, way up north. Um, but I think the principles are all kind of applicable across the board. So there are five broad categories into which I would say um, conditions are going to be changing. Um, higher average temperatures, of course, Monica's gone over this, all of this already. These are uh, pretty basic things. And the fifth one, which I'm going to cover right at the very, very end, is minimal hydro hydrocarbon intensity. And I think that's crucial, and uh, we'll have a chance to maybe talk about that later in our question and answer period. So positive and negative impacts are going to result from each one of these broad growing condition categories. Um, the higher temperatures are, uh, I have to remember to change my slides. Higher average temperatures, of course, are the one area in which there are some truly positive impacts. More heat units, of course, means we have a longer growing season. It means we can grow things in our area that we could not previously do. So our economic options are actually opened up a little bit. Um, and for people who are producing seed or trying to overwinter plants for food, that also improves the odds of doing that successfully. Uh, there are lots of negative, negative impacts from higher average temperatures as well. I'm not going to read them all out to you. You guys can read those there. Um, the important thing is how we're adapting to these things. Um, so in our place, 
in our, in our climate, what we've been doing for quite a bit of time, and this is often overlooked in the province, is breeding our own plant varieties, saving seed, overwintering plants. Um, you can't expect varieties which are produced in the U.S. in warm, warm climates to actually adapt to our local conditions in, uh, in any meaningful way in a single season. Whereas if you are acclimatizing that species or those varieties to your climate, you have much more, um, much more sur survivability and much more success, at least from our perspective anyway. Um, of course, we can grow more early, early uh, maturing varieties of many crops, but in our, in our particular, particular part of the world, squash, corn, dry beans. Um, other things we're doing to adapt to this much hotter weather, of course, when you have employees and, and whatnot out there working in, in fields and garden plots, um, you need to start working much earlier. You have to adjust that climate, uh, that schedule, because nobody wants to work out there when it's, you know, 30 above. It's really difficult, and it's not good for the quality of your plants going into cold storage. Um, so, yeah, there are a number of important things that I would say we need to emphasize. One of these, of course, for vegetable growers is that you need to have a market that can absorb quantities of product very quickly. Um, we do this through CSA Farmers Market and we have relationships with wholesale buyers. And I'll just throw out there as an example. Last year, our, our production window for green beans went from six weeks down to three weeks. So we produce the same quantity, but in half the time. And if you're planning to have that product go out over six weeks and now you have that compressed, that's challenging. So if you've got great relationships with a number of different buyers and you can work that out very, very quickly, that will save you a lot of losses as well. So second broad category, decreased water availability. There's not a whole lot of positive that goes along with this. I mean, the lower soil moisture content is going to be a problem. The only positive, and I was really reaching here, uh, is less potential for fungal diseases in plants. Uh, otherwise, it's all negative from my perspective. Decreased productivity, lower quality, um, increased potential for erosion, of course. Anytime you've got soil drying out to that degree and you then have heavy downpours or strong winds. And stressed plants in a, in a drought situation, of course, increasingly vulnerable to disease and pests. So the ways in which we've been trying to adapt to these uh, these drier conditions, of course, um, redu we reduce all of our water waste, so we're not wasting anything. Um, we do use some grey water systems, so that doesn't mean household grey water, but anything that comes out of our washing systems, that's all used for irrigation and watering in another location, but it's definitely not wasted. Uh, we do not live in an area where we have irrigation, so we're only catching water and uh, using well water, which isn't long term a good solution for irrigation either. Uh, we've invested in, in, in efficient irrigation technology, uh, drip lines, solar electric pumps, and automated and intelligent control systems. Uh, just now we're, be we're beginning to invest in water catchment systems, and this really comes from, to a certain degree, from the permaculture movement. Uh, so in investing in water catchment systems both for surface runoff and for building runoff. So either in-ground storage or above-ground storage. Of course, conscientious management of tillage. This is extremely important. Um, you don't want to be out there exacerbating dry soil conditions. Uh, you want to time that very carefully. You want to minimize it as much as possible. Uh, again, adapting plant varieties uh, to local conditions through selective breeding. This is extremely important and, like I said before, often overlooked in our province. We reach out to other producers of vegetable seeds to provide us with our, our stock, our seed stock. And I think the grain producers have been a little bit better in this regard, grain and oilseed and pulse producers uh, in this province than the vegetable producers. So I think we have all together maybe two, three producers of vegetable seeds in Alberta. Otherwise, everything comes from very, very much further away. Um, the last thing there, just focusing on, oil, on increasing soil organic matter. Uh, soils that are rich in organic matter hold more moisture. They lose moisture more slowly. So extremely important. Um, as Monica mentioned, uh, northward ecosystem drift. So this is perhaps the one area where for a grower the impacts are a little bit less tangible to begin with but eventually are going to be a problem. So introduction of new plant diseases, introduction of new insect pests, introduction of new weeds. Uh, none of these things especially good uh, but possibly balanced out by introduction of new beneficial insects and birds. Hard to say. And in terms of how we are adapting to this, adapting to the new arrivals from the south, very careful observation of your plant health and new insects and plants that you haven't seen before, sticky traps so that you can do population assays and, of course, catch them, catch insects, increased applications of biological controls in our case, and a lot more use of floating row covers. 
So Rime, Agarbon, those sorts of things. This one here, probably the most difficult to plan for, to adapt to, because it's, uh, it, by definition, <laughs> hard to adapt to something that's unpredictable. So negative impacts are obvious to everybody that lives in this province. We've all had serious hailstorms, at least I think we've all had pretty serious hailstorms. Uh, so loss of quality or absolute complete catastrophic crop, crop loss is also possible. Soil erosion, increased soil erosion. Damage to infrastructure, also not unheard of due to increasingly violent and volatile weather. And stress, of course, as a farmer, if you're trying to deal with volatile conditions that make it hard to plan and make it hard to work around, um, it increases the amount of stress in your life. So in terms of adapting to uh, the instability, we've been moving and are planning to move more production into, into high tunnels row, and under row covers and in greenhouses. Uh, we don't just produce vegetables, we're a, we're a small mixed farm, so anything that ends up not being marketable can be salvaged for, um, for feed value. We've got both chickens and pigs and they'll eat just about anything that comes out of a garden that can't be sold. Um, we have some tight protocols in place for recovery. If the damage is really, really intense, you need to do very quick assessments. You need to be able to salvage things very quickly. You need to be able to till things in and reseed and replant. And that all has to happen in a very short time frame when your growing season is really only about 110 days long, or at least your frost-free growing season. Um, diversity. This is something that, um, again, I think is often overlooked. Um, the more diversity you have in your production system, the better chance that something will thrive in that partic those particular conditions that year. It is the insurance policy of the planet, and it should be an insurance policy that all of us have in place on our farms. If you're growing one variety of uh, corn, and the conditions are not particularly conducive to its production that year, uh, you won't get a crop. If you're growing three varieties, there's a good chance that one of those will thrive under those conditions. And the last thing I'd like to talk about, and uh, just really, really briefly, um, all of us, whether we're organic producers or, or conventional producers, we are super, super dependent on fossil fuels. And that's the reason that we are in this situation. Uh, it's about one third of all greenhouse gas production on the planet is attributable to agriculture. And uh, the, the more organically oriented ones, of course, don't contribute quite that much, but it is still significant. And it's something that we all need to think about moving away from. So there are supports in this province, uh, like there never have been before, to be able to adopt some renewable energy technologies and to apply them in your farming operation. Um, there's some really, really beautiful and highly sophisticated machines coming out of France and other parts of Europe primarily. I mentioned NIO technologies there because I think all of you should go and look at what they're producing. There are weeding drones. And um, of course, they're prohibitively expensive at this point in time, but those, as they scale up, those things are going to become more and more accessible. accessible. Um, the calorie trends, uh, tra what, what do we call this here? I'm losing my words. The, the caloric win in terms of our agricultural production is actually a loss right now. So because we are so dependent on, on fossil fuel energy, we're putting about 20 calories of energy in to produce one single calorie of organic grain energy. <clears throat> and we need to really consider this equation very seriously and find ways to use human and animal power where it is actually appropriate because the, the caloric win can actually be positive as opposed to negative. And the last thing I would want to say, you know, 200 years ago, people could not imagine how we would be farming. 100 years ago, 50 years ago, people couldn't imagine how we were farming now. So we all need to be able to uh, have some sort of capacity to imagine agriculture beyond the diesel and gas powered iron that we're dependent on now and uh, take it to those places because that's what's going to, going to take to adapt to changing conditions. Thank you all. I'm not 100% sure if I heard him right there, but did he just say weeding drone? I'm not a really big tech guy, but that sounds really, really cool. I thought another well, pretty wild part of his presentation was when he said that there's only two to three vegetable seed producers in Alberta. That sounds like something that really needs to change. I also thought Chris brought up a really important point that changes in climate can also have a big impact on producers' mental health. Most producers are stressed out about 90% of the time and more erratic, more intense, extreme weather events are definitely not going to help the situation. Last but not least was Heather Kirschbaumer. She's from Fairview, so up in Peace Country, and she concluded the keynote for us. And I know this sounds like a total farmer stereotype, but 
She just had a really down-to-earth, easy-to-understand way of speaking and explaining things. She's an organic forage seed grower and the president of Forage Seed Canada. I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I just am going to tell you from our farm perspective what we would do or what our plans would be going forward so that we can handle whatever the future may bring. So around us, we notice in our area that we have a lot of trees already that are dying. We have a, a, quite a few of the old poplars in our area. And we were wondering, why is it that we see all of this level of trees and all the old tall ones are just dead? So I actually went and I talked to someone who works at the Fairview College about this. And he said, well, maybe our trees are just old. So we thought maybe that's part of it. Maybe they're just getting near the end of their life. And maybe they've been weakened by, by age, so they're more susceptible to disease, they're more susceptible to drought, they're more susceptible to bugs, caterpillars, uh, all of the chemicals that we're spraying in the area. So maybe this is part of what's happening, and maybe it has never been rejuvenated by a fire for 100 years. So maybe it's a combination of all of these things. But we did notice also we have land that's farther north, it's near Dixonville, and we don't notice that up there at all. So that was what caught our eye. So we were thinking maybe that is because maybe they did have a fire up there. But we were, it made us start wondering about this climate change, just what's happening already. So uh, we were talking to a couple different people about this. And even uh, my husband's father said when he moved here, or up to Fairview, this was back in 1928, uh, there's coolies. I don't know if you guys know, Dunvegan has big coolies and we're along the edge there. So we have areas of our land that starts at our place and the coolies progressively get deeper down to the, to the river. And they used to be able to see across, for miles across, they could see their neighbors from, everybody could see everybody else's farm like a mile and two miles over. And this was back in the 1920s. Since then, those trees have all grown up. So we know that we do have trees that are probably you know, 90 years old or 80 years old. So that probably has a lot to do with it, but that probably also is having to do with our climate changing now just because of the drought. So if the climate changes as is predicted, we went through a bunch of different scenarios. If it gets drier, it's going to get, or if it gets warmer, I should say, it is going to get drier. We're going to have more heat units. We're going to have maybe more frost-free days. So we're probably going to have more extreme weather. And we already are noticing that with these storms that we get. When we get a drought, it seems like we have these longer droughts. Even in one season, the droughts are longer. We don't get those common three-day rains that we used to get. We don't seem to see the, the three days of three inches of rain. Instead, we're getting three inches in three hours instead of getting three inches in three days. We're also getting, uh, when it's wet, it's very wet. When it's dry, it's very dry. So if we are going to change our own farming practices, the first thing we just, like amongst ourselves, we discussed this already, is fiber in our soil is going to be the most co uh, crucial component. We need our soil to act like a sponge. So when we do get that rain, we're going to keep some of that rain. We don't want it all to just run off. So it's going to help us potentially in a, in a dry year. We want to have that sponge that's already absorbed as much of the moisture as we can get. We want to save our spring moisture and we want to save any moisture we get through the year. So then when we do get a five inch rain, we also want it to act as if it is porous enough so the, the rain can soak through so we get to uh, absorb it into our subsoil moisture so we don't have this lack of subsoil moisture that we sometimes have had in the last few years. To do that, we would use, which we already do, alfalfas and clovers or perennial plants that will break down the hard pan so that we don't have that uh, hard pan layer keeping the moisture from the subsoil. We are going to use more green manure crops, which we already do, but we would probably rotate them maybe more often. So instead of having a rotation of every four or five years of a, of a green manure crop, we might do it every three years. 
We would try to build our fiber because we would want to maintain the water when we get it. We would try to use also, um, for weed control, we're going to use surface tillage, shallow tillage, I guess I'd say, rather than, say, plowing, which is going to uh, have your soil exposed. And we would try our best not to have any soil exposure. We would also be trying to use surface tillage for our weed control because we're organic. We have to be thinking the way our grandparents thought. Without using, we used to have to uh, summer follow every one third of our crop when we started farming, when we were farming our uh, father's land. They wrote into our agreement that we had to summer follow one third of the acres every year. So we had black land, one third acres every year. And we would never do that anymore. We've learned that that is absolutely not the way to go. We would try to keep a mulch in the top three or four inches so that we always have that uh, maintaining moisture plus weed control. From a cropping perspective, I think there would be pros to the warmer weather and cons to the drier weather. So on the plus side, with better uh, use of uh, heat units, we probably would be able to grow different crops that we can't grow right now. With our longer growing season, we would probably be able to have the more frost-free days, so maybe more better varieties would be accessible. We might be able to grow lentils. We might be able to grow chickpeas. We might be able to grow beans. Like, who knows? So we would have to be aware and watching the heat units so that we're taking advantage of the changes rather than seeing only the negative, there's going to be some positives too. I think alfalfa would be one of the most important crops that we would be growing up where we are, and we would probably be able to grow better quality alfalfa. Our alfalfa seed up where we are probably gets froze one out of every two or three years. So if we had a few more uh, heat days, it might make a big difference in an alfalfa crop. Uh, we would have Climate, potentially, we already have some river flat land where they grow corn. It's like market garden land. And maybe the top would become more like that. So then we would be able to grow corn. Who knows? On the negative side, though, the lack of water is definitely going to be the biggest issue. So we have to be really careful not to have bare soil. We're going to have to keep that mulch on the surface. We're always going to be trying to build up the fiber. So we're going to be sealing our land earlier in the spring because we won't be able to afford to take that chance of missing that window. We're going to have to get rid of that hard pan. We're going to have to make sure we're always constantly thinking, save water, build fiber, seal the land. And we're going to be using a lot of legumes in our green manures, like sweet clover, red clover, alfalfa. Then we feel that our crops have the potential to thrive. So any of these cereals that we're normally growing, like the oats or the wheat or the barley or the peas, is going to do just fine if we maintain a proper uh, rotation, earlier, faster rotations. And I, I drew myself this map. My husband helped me with this all, John, sitting out there. And he says, I don't know if anybody can see this. I should have made a PowerPoint. But it's like an ocean with a wave, and it's a big wave, and every year, or every two or three or four years. We're going to have these rotations where we have, this is a straight line in here, is our break even of our costs of our farm. And you have this wave that goes below and above and below and above and below and above. Our goal is we want to make the line towards the bottom of the wave so our break even is at the low and our profit is at the high. So we're we're farther above the break even instead of half above and half below. And we think that if we do proper management techniques, that's always been our goal is show more profit. But in the future, there is potential for this area where we farm, which is the north, it's going to, we have probably more benefit by it than negative by it if we can manage our water. So that's our perspective. So thank you. really like that wave analogy Heather came up with there. I think that's something that's going to stick with me for a while. And that's what we got for you today. 
Thank you to the Alberta Real Estate Foundation for providing financial support for this podcast. And thank you to Amber Canyon, Chris Vester, Heather Kirschbaumer, and Monica Kohler for the presentations at the Organic Alberta Conference in 2018. This podcast episode would not be possible without you. Today's episode was recorded at Get a Grip Studios in Toronto because I'm back east visiting some family and friends right now. Rural Roots to Climate Solutions is a central Alberta-based project empowering rural Albertans with climate solutions. Along with producing this podcast, Rural Roots runs workshops and farm field days. Our next workshop will be about how to create your very own farmer's cooperative. It'll take place in Stettler and it's taking place on February 2nd. For more details, please go to the website at www.rr2, that's a numeric to, cs.ca. You can also make a comment about this episode if you go to the website. Rural Roots to Climate Solutions is backed up by a fantastic advisory committee made up of Brenda Barrett, Dana Penrice, Mark Fox, and Kim Cornish. Hats off to Kieran Mountain of Mountain Media and Red Deer for editing the last two podcast episodes, episodes seven and eight. Happy farming wherever you are in Alberta. I hope everybody has a great Christmas. And remember, what's good for the farm is usually good for the climate.